Let's go to our preaching time. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Ephesians 4. And I don't know why it all seems to come to a head on Sunday mornings, but the week following my medical treatment, my nose just wants to run like crazy. It always starts running when I stand up here behind the pulpit. It wasn't running before church started, but it's running now, so. I don't know. At least I'm able to stand. At least I'm able to stand here. Okay. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read three short verses there. Those will be verses 4, 5, and 6. It says there, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Verse 5 says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Actually, there are seven baptisms described for us in the Word of God. Paul also wrote, for though there be that are called gods whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. But to us there is but one God, 1 Corinthians 8, verses 5 and 6. So when he says there is one baptism, he must mean that there's one real baptism, of which all the others are pictures and types in some way. But you won't learn about that um, unless you believe in comparing Scripture with Scripture and let the Scriptures explain themselves. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. God tells the Christian what he's supposed to do, study. He tells him why he's supposed to do it, so he, he won't be ashamed before God one day. And then he tells him how he's supposed to do it, by rightly dividing the word of truth. Isaiah 28 verse 10 tells us, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. A uh, guy, I, somehow I got sucked into some big group email chain uh, earlier this year, and a guy sent out an unsolicited manuscript, about 35 pages of rant uh, on how Christians can potentially lose their salvation. And he said, we have to take all the scriptures in context. We can't just, we have to stop cutting and pasting and picking parts of a verse here and a part of a verse there, putting them together uh, to create a doctrine and ignore the, the general context of all those verses. Now that might be sound advice, if you're talking about a science textbook or a math textbook or simply someone's biography. But we're not talking about those things. We're talking about the words of the living God. And I cited, and so I jumped in and, and responded. Nobody else was responding to this guy. And uh, what I told him was, I was hoping for a white elephant gift at Christmas time and your 35 page rant didn't disappoint. I said, thank you for your unsolicited manuscript. And I said, you say we have to stop cutting and, and picking and choosing and piecing parts of a verse here, part of a verse there. I said, and I cited Isaiah 28, 10. I said, that's exactly what we're supposed to do many times. Compare scripture with scripture and see where the language is, where the vocabulary matches two verses match each other, you put those two together and you begin to see things and patterns emerge in the scriptures. But, um, so I'm going to, this is what we call today the seven baptisms. The seven baptisms. And I'm going to ask you to turn to several texts as we go. And you can either write them down or turn quickly. And uh, to avoid fat finger and having a crowded pulpit. I've got a smaller New Testament I'm going to use today to turn along with you. But first of all, 
Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And as I said, one baptism, one baptism is the real baptism. And the other six that I'm going to list for you are pictures and types, images of that one real baptism in some way. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's begin at the very first verse. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Let's read verses 3 and 4. And did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. This is what I'm going to call the baptism unto Moses, if you want to title each one. The baptism unto Moses. And it refers to something that took place over 1,300 years before John the Baptist was ever born. And verse 2 says, And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. This was Israel stepping off of the shore and into the Red Sea where God had been dividing the waters all night long before that. And the same cloud that would lead Israel for the next 40 years in the wilderness, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, that same cloud was evidently in between those two walls of water so that the people had to pass through the mist as the army of Pharaoh was uh, in hot pursuit behind them. And uh, you might say this is the only place in the scripture where you could possibly say a child or an infant was baptized, some baby that was mother was carrying in her arms as they walked through there. But it wouldn't be baptism by immersion as we practice it, but uh, aspersion, which if you look at the word aspersion in the dictionary, it means to sprinkle with water as in baptism. Of course, we don't believe in sprinkling babies or anybody else with water and calling that baptism. We call that sprinkling. Uh, in fact, I had the idea of, you know how these churches are always trying to come up with a new twist to get more people into their, into their building, more members, more, whether it's Rick Warren or somebody else, he's got some new gimmick. We need to attract more people. We need to have a, we have a mega church of 10,000. We need to grow. We need to have 20,000. So I had the idea of starting a new twist on baptism. And that would be either by replacing the baptismal pool with a dunking tank. <laughs> or give all the other church members water balloons. And they can bombard the new convert with. <laughs> or give everybody a super soaker. You know, that sounds ridiculous, and we would never do that, but I guarantee you there are churches out there, if they watch this video on the internet this coming week, they'll say, you know, I could, I could do that. We could do that. There are people out there who want to twist and modify the scriptures and change the scriptures and change the example in the Bible, in the Bible to suit their own needs and it's all for, for selfish gain. But um, the people left the comfort of eat of comforts as it were and the life of Egypt that they had known for four centuries behind and on the other side of that cloud they were going to follow God for the next for the un unforeseeable future they were going to follow God as God led them through Moses and that's what I would call the baptism unto Moses now secondly let me have you go to the book of Matthew chapter 3 Matthew chapter 3, and notice there verses uh, 11 and 12. Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12. Here John the Baptist preaching, and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff 
with unquenchable fire. This is what I'm going to call the baptism of Israel. The baptism of Israel. And the titles of these different points may overlap each other, but just bear with me. And uh, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, verse 11. When John the Baptist said, uh, I baptize you, he wasn't speaking to you, nor was he speaking to me. Uh, his ministry was foretold by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 40, and verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Uh, his ministry was revealed to Mary in Luke chapter 1, and also to his earthly father, Zacharias, in Luke chapter 1. And it says there in Luke 1, or rather in, um, in Luke 1, verse 68, He hath visited and redeemed His people. God said, I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Back in Leviticus 26, verse 12. John says in John 1, in verse 31, that his purpose for baptizing was so that he, Jesus, might be made manifest unto Israel. Jesus himself came to be baptized of John. And why was that? Well, the Bible says he was numbered with the transgressors, Isaiah 53, verse 12. In Matthew 3, verse 14, John says, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it, um, uh, for thus it, for, uh, I'm not, I can't even quote it, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was going to identify with the sinners and do what the sinner was expected to do at the preaching of John, to come and submit himself to the authority of a prophet and to hear the word of that prophet. And uh, by example, he did what the sinners were supposed to do, what Israel was supposed to do. John came preaching um, and baptizing unto repentance to the nation of Israel. And uh, evidently, those who would... Now, the Pharisees were too proud. They would never submit to somebody as crude and uncouth as John the Baptist, some guy out there eating locusts or grasshoppers, if, as it were, and, and you know, leather girdle and wild honey. A rough and crude guy. Undoubtedly, he hadn't bathed in a while either, you know. Getting down that river every day to baptize was the closest he came to a bath in years. I promise you that. But you can laugh at it. I mean, it's okay. But, but they would never submit to somebody as plain spoken and as rough and as crude and rude to them as John the Baptist was. And evidently those that, that did submit to him, evidently those who came and, and, and confessed their sins and submitted to the word of a prophet. They hadn't seen a prophet like him in centuries. And evidently, those that would submit to John the Baptist, when Jesus showed up, their hearts had then been conditioned to receive Jesus when he finally showed up. John said, John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, and directed everybody to start following Jesus from that time on. But this is what I'd call the baptism uh, of Israel. Let's, com let's continue. Thirdly, go, if you will, forward to the book of Matthew, chapter 20. Matthew, chapter 20. And... Let's begin there with verse 20. Matthew chapter 20, starting at verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, that would be James and John, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, 
and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. This is what I'm going to call the baptism of Christ's death. Um, Jesus is on his way to Calvary. His baptism by John the Baptist was already three years in the past at this point. And uh, this baptism is not one of water, but it is in anticipation of his coming death. Look there in verse uh, 18. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. He was expecting it to come very soon. So when he says baptism here, the baptism which I am baptized, it has nothing to do with water baptism has nothing to do with infant baptism. Has to, it's, a, it's a euphemism for Christ's impending death. And he says in Matthew chapter 12 that Jonah, being swallowed by a whale, was a picture of his soon death and burial and then resurrection after that. And uh, we talk about that a lot at Easter time when we have to clarify the misconception, the, the uh, confusion caused by Roman Catholicism on the timetable of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. When did he die and all that? But Jesus said, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah being swallowed by a whale. You know, just as Israel left one thing and on the other side of their baptism pursued something else, Christ died and left a physical body, in, in a physical body of limitation. And after his resurrection, he received a glorified body of immortality. Something limited was replaced by something unlimited. And uh, it, it's, an, it's an amazing thing that you go from one form into another, and baptism is the, the means, the term in the Bible to signify that. And as I say, there are several different baptisms in the scriptures, and we're looking at them today. But to go from a limited life to limited flesh to be incorruptible, supernatural, immortal, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, and promises to you and I, is an amazing thing. It is an ama to think that Jesus did it, and those of us who are clinging to Him depend uh, expect it to happen to us as well. So, like I say, I'm I may not be perfect at illustrating all six of these, but you can see how I hope you'll see in the end all the other six are pictures of the seventh, which we'll get to in time. But Jonah was fearful and rebellious and disobedient, heading the opposite direction from where God told him to go, and God sends along a whale to swallow him up. And don't you know, once that whale spit him out, he was more than happy to go preach to, to Nineveh. I like what Jack Chick illustrated in his track uh, about Jonah, that the, uh, the digestive juices in that whale's stomach probably bleached his skin so he came out looking like a ghost or something out of some sci-fi movie. You don't know about those things. There are a lot of things in the Bible. You have to kind of let your imagination have some fun once in a while. And you really get a, a good picture of what was going on. But I can't wait to get to heaven so I fully understand everything that happened. You know. But for right now, we'll just have to conjecture. Fourthly, I want you to go, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'm going to try to move along here. Acts chapter 2. Here's the day of Pentecost. And uh, we'll start there at verse 36. Verse 36 through 38. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. Preachers preaching, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The baptism here is not believer's baptism, as a lot of Christians think. You'll see some bumper stickers that says, uh, uh, Obey the Bible, Acts 2.38, for salvation. Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, is not the plan of salvation for the child of God today. Um, notice the question was not, what must I do to be saved? That's what the Philippian jailer asked, Acts 16, verse 30. That wasn't their question. But their question was, in light of the fact that we've just slain our Messiah, as you say, what should we do? What do we do now? That was the question. It had nothing to do with what must I do to be saved. And he says, uh, verse 38, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Romans 3, verse 25, the Apostle Paul makes a very clear phrase. He says uh, that Christ had sent his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. You know the word for, that little word F-O-R, goes two directions. When you go to a fast food restaurant, you pay for the meal before you get it. But if you go to a nice sit-down restaurant, you pay for the meal after you have it. The word for can go in two directions. And it's, and it's in light of past remissions, past blessings to the nation of Israel, that for which they should, be they should get baptized now and repent of their sin, repent of having slain the Messiah, as Peter just reminded them, and God would grant to them uh, remission of sins, or God would grant to them forgiveness, rather. And so it's a baptism of repentance, but it isn't, th this was after Calvary. This is after they slew their Messiah and hanged him on a, on a tree of Calvary. And Peter reminds them of that and says, and they said, in light of this fact, in effect, what should we do? That was their question, was not, what must I do to be saved? But what do we do in light of the fact that we just murdered our Messiah? And he's giving him another chance to get right as a nation. Now, this was written to the, the nation of Israel only. Look there, well, I'm not going to read them all, but look at verse 5, verse 17, verse 22, verse 36. And it's for, the, it's for salvation, but it's for the nation of Israel only. Uh, he says there in verse 39, For the promise is unto you, Israel, and to your children, Israel, and to all that are afar off, those will be Jews dispersed throughout the world, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And he says the promise, also the promise given to the Jew, also included the manifestation of speaking uh, with other tongues. Isaiah 28. Uh, prophesied. So he's given them a, a chance to repent of having just murdered their Messiah. But that's not what you and I are taught as sinners, Gentiles, in the rest of the New Testament. So let's continue. Point number five. Go forward, if you will, to Acts chapter 10. Acts 10 and let's begin there at verse 43. Here Peter's preaching to Cornelius, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. This is what we'll call the baptism of the new believer. 
the baptism of the new believer. Uh, and it's is probably as close to uh, the baptism you and I follow when we trust Jesus Christ to save us. Notice um, he says, baptized in the name of the Lord, verse 48. The word Lord can be used to include Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three in the Godhead. can all be summarized with the one word Lord. By the way, if Acts 2.38 was the plan of salvation, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, as a church 200, 300 yards up the street preaches, the church up the street preaches that Acts 2.38 is the plan of salvation. Jesus only, repent in the name of Jesus only. If Acts 2.38, by the lips of Simon Peter, are the plan of salvation, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, then Peter violated his own commandment when he says he'd baptize them in the name of the Lord. So he wasn't even consistent. But this is what we might call believer's baptism. And by the way, this is not the true baptism of which all the others are types. So don't misunderstand me as we go. Cornelius already believes. He already has the Holy Spirit. That was evident, but he began speaking in tongues as a testimony to those Jews that came with Simon Peter. He already has the Holy Ghost. And uh, he's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. But he gets baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. As many of us as were baptized into his death were baptized into Christ. Uh, Romans 6 verse 3. And he has believed on Jesus Christ. He has believed the gospel that Peter preached to him. And uh, Peter says, Can any man forbid water that he should not be baptized as we? Well, no. When you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. And after the Holy Spirit lives in you, the first act of obedience should be to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. It's an outward testimony of something that's taken place inside the heart. But getting wet, getting in the water itself, does nothing. I spoke to a guy, in fact, a guy who watched our videos, called me yesterday from Indonesia. I spent two hours talking to this guy. And... Uh, we talked about water baptism and uh, how Roman Catholicism and liberal Protestantism, Lutherans and Presbyterians and uh, some Method United Methodists and Episcopalians and um, Congregationalists and so forth. They all think, and I said Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, the Church of Christ, they all think that somehow that physical act of getting wet or getting baptized with water somehow produces a great spiritual change inside of you. It doesn't produce anything doesn't do anything except make you wet. Hand me a towel. Right? That's all it does. But, it, but for the believer, it is an outward expression of something that has now taken place in the heart. The old nature is dead. A new nature is alive to Jesus Christ. And, um, and I'm also, you know, when you get baptized in water as a new Christian, you're you're illustrating at least three things. Number one, you're, you're illustrating the death of Jesus Christ. He died, he was buried in a tomb, and he rose out of, the, out of the tomb after three days and three nights. And you are identifying yourself with him. You're identifying yourself as a, as a follower of him. My old nature is now dead, and a new nature is alive. He's re quickened me by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 2.1. And you are also illustrating... Uh, in type, in a picture, your future resurrection. One day, this body may be laid in a tomb, in a cemetery, in a grave, but it's going to come back in supernatural form. You're illustrating all of these things, like laying your head on a pillow. You know, when we, when I work in a funeral home during the week, one of the best compliments somebody can give is to say, well, he looks like he's just sleeping. She looks like she's just sleeping. And every embalmer sits in the back. Yeah, I like hearing that. I like hearing that. But when you sleep, it's with the idea that you're going to wake up again, right? And so believer's baptism pictures all of those things. But, but the water itself, the act of getting back, does nothing. All it does is it expresses your new faith in Jesus Christ. Let's move on. Point number six. I'm going to try to hurry here. 
Go back, if you will, to Matthew chapter 3 again. Matthew 3. Matthew 3 and uh, verses 11 and 12. Once again, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, notice, and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And this is what we, we call the baptism of fire, for lack of a better term, baptism of fire. And uh, it's for unsaved sinners who die without Jesus Christ. One day, uh, Revelation 20, verses 13, 14, 15, say that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And ultimately, that's where this verse will find its fulfillment, in a lake of fire for those without Jesus Christ. And um, the Pentecostal brethren, and I say brethren because I know a lot of them that are truly saved. They're just not very deep in their Bible studies. But the, they'll maintain that this is a reference to being baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire speaking in tongues. It has nothing to do with that. Because Acts chapter 2 says, There appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire. So they connect that with this verse and say, Well, Christ baptizing me with fire is like, the Holy Ghost coming upon me like it did in, in uh, the day of Pentecost. Things that are different aren't the same, and those are not the same. But uh, this has nothing to do with Jesus Christ baptizing you with power and fire to go out and preach the gospel and cast out devils and perform miracles and the blind are going to see and the lame are going to walk and so on. This is a prediction that Jesus Christ is one day going to judge the wicked and burn them up with unquenchable fire, as verse 12 says. Notice verse 10, yeah, right in the context, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Verse 11, Baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 12, He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This has to do with judgment on the unbeliever. This is judgment of the sinner, the one who dies without Jesus Christ, the one who never knew the saving grace, the saving mercy of uh, Jesus Christ, who was never born again. This is the baptism of fire. Don't let anyone ever confound you or confuse you and make you think, well, this has to do with the Holy Spirit coming on believers on the day of Pentecost. Had nothing to do with that. Now, let's get to the last one. Point number seven. This will be the baptism which all the others are pictures in some way. Go, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians 12, and we'll read verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it has nothing to do with you falling on the floor or standing up and then speaking in other tongues. It has nothing to do with you, you know, calling down devils and or call, casting out devils or calling down the power and the fire of God to burn up your enemies and people that criticize you on your, uh, you know, on your Facebook page. It has nothing to do with that. This is this is the one baptism of which all the others are types and pictures in some way. And this is the spiritual baptism that takes place when a sinner goes from sinner to saint by trusting in Jesus Christ. The very moment I asked Christ to, God to save me, forgive me of my sins, I went from sinner to saint. And at that moment, I was baptized with, by, through, in the Holy Spirit. This is, this is clearly Holy Spirit baptism. 
has nothing to do with Acts chapter 2, has nothing to do with 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, this, or, or 14 rather. This is what all the others are angling at, that all the others are hinting at in some way to go from a sinner to a saint. Tis done the great transactions done. I am the Lord's and he is mine. He drew me and I followed on, charmed to confess the voice divine. Happy day, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. When that happens, a sinner is regenerated by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 2, 1. His dead spirit is now alive to the, to the, the desires of God and the, and the will of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit lives inside of him from that moment on. And Jesus said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'll be with thee all the way, even unto the end of the world. This is the true baptism, to go from bad to better, to go from worse to perfect, to go from sinner to saint, to go from this limited uh, form of flesh and blood to an expectation of immortality and incorruptibility one day. Uh, I was telling this guy on the phone yesterday, according to Ephesians 2, 6, God had raised us up together and made us sit together in, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's right now. Part of me is in heaven now because my dead spirit was joined to the Holy Spirit the day I got saved. But not only that, not only is my dead, it was my dead spirit now joined to the Holy Spirit, but it was also joined to every other Christian who's joined to the Holy Spirit. So do I fully understand that? Of course not. But that's what the scriptures indicate, that you and I enter into the body of Jesus Christ. He baptizes us into the body of saints, the body of believers, the very moment we trust him to save us. It has nothing to do with water, has nothing to do with miracles and speaking in tongues and all of those emotional things. This has to do with trusting the one who loved you enough to die on the cross of Calvary to wash away your sins by his own shed blood and can give you eternal life. So these, and I'm, I've probably not done them justice, but these are the seven baptisms in the scriptures. One is the real baptism every sinner needs. Uh, all the others are pictures in some type to go from, uh, from worse to better after the baptism takes place.